The No Nonsense Roundtable. It's a weekly show broadcast on Rochester, New York's 50,000 watt iHeart radio station, News Radio Wham 1180. The host, Dom Geneva, interviews guests from all walks of life, all with amazing stories to tell. What you are about to hear is a recording of a previous broadcast without the breaks and commercials. Now, here's host, Dom Geneva. Well, welcome, everybody, to another edition of the No Nonsense Roundtable. My name is Dom Jennifer, your host every Saturday from 10 to 11, right here on News Radio Wham 1180. And today, I have somebody that everybody knows, and everybody in Rochester is, uh, well, I guess, familiar with in one way or another. And in his business, he has adapted, changed, morphed, become nationally famous. Uh, is about to be inducted into the Rochester Music Hall of Fame on April 30th and known by, well, it's pretty good when somebody gets to the point where they're only have to, you only have to say one word to know who they are. I mean, look at this. I mean, you got Elvis, Sting, Prince, Madonna, and on the show today, I have Wheeze, <laughs> better known as Brother Wheeze. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Brother Dominic. Can I call you Dominic, or does it have to be Dom? No, uh, Dom or Dominic is fine. I, I, I answer to either. Okay, Brother Dom. You know, I, I, when I was, uh, it was really a great day for me a, a couple Octobers ago when I was inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame because... Uh, I had just a couple notes. I usually ad lib anything. I I have never written a speech in my whole life, and I have spoken often. I don't like getting up in front of people, but when I do, I still just ad lib, which I will do for this Rochester Music Hall. I've completely ad lib, but at the Roch- at the inter- at the international at the National Radio Hall of Fame induction in Chicago, I did have like a couple little words written down, and one of them was a lot. What a long, strange trip it's been, which are Grateful Dead lyrics, but. But my life has been a really long, strange trip. And the funniest thing was a big, famous national DJ, Jonathan Brandmeier out of Chicago, introduced me that way. And it freaked me out because I had written it down in he. And when I talked to him after the event, I said, where'd you get that long, strange trip? He said, because people know you, Wheeze. And I, I think it's a long, strange trip. And it is... Uh, Completely, if nothing else, you know, when people try to belittle me, which happens often, you had mentioned off air when we were talking and meeting each other, how people in Rochester are a little self-deprecating. It's only Rochester, blah, blah, blah. And you said yourself, Dom, that it's a great city and has a lot of great things to offer. But, you know, over the years, when people would try to make fun of me because, oh, you know, you're a big deal in Rochester, New York. Let me tell you something. Now that I have that national thing, that's, a, you know, it's just something in my pocket. But the fact of the matter is, when Seinfeld came out, great, one of the best TV shows ever, in my opinion, people used to say, it's only going to work in New York. People in the Midwest aren't going to understand this crap. Funny is funny. In my radio show is... But when we were out in New York City, the phones lit up all night long in Manhattan. It, you know, you're good, you're good. And back when we used to play music, when going way back, when I was on a music rock and roll station, there was a guy in Rochester, and I know him personally. I'm not going to name the brother, but he owns a great record store. He made bumper stickers saying, Rochester Radio Insults My Intelligence. <laughs> And I, you know, <laughs> when you were in the in the music radio and radio in the whole country played the same music, New York City, their stations played the same crap every station played because it's one big business. But people in Rochester just think it's better if you're in a different city, uh, which is not true. 
I know I'm laughing because I always say you have to live someplace else to realize what a great place this is. It's a good I mean, point. even if you want to get to an airport, if you're I lived in the New York City area, it would take an hour and a half to get to the airport, and it takes you another half an hour, hour to get from the from the shuttle bus to the airport, and then oh my God, it's, it's terrible here. You got a beautiful airport, you got a beautiful atmosphere and country and things to do and whatever. As a matter of fact, somebody last week, uh, two weeks ago, I had on the show a hundred great things to do in Rochester before you die. It's a great place. So that that whole thing that you're talking about is about your your life taking twists and turns is fascinating that's really what this show is about so one of the questions i like asking people it's kind of a corny little question is like what did you want to do when you were 10 years old what did you think where, where did you think yeah look at that where, where did you think you were going to go oh melanie is just is just laughing here she's well the funny thing is uh, that i'm so friggin' old i'm way older than brother dom over here yeah. that i i have no i never thought of being anything my, I had a father who was a bookmaker, uh, had been busted, a lot of things. I, to be honest with you, I wanted to be a bookmaker. <laughs> uh, and by the way, because you seem like quite the straight guy to me, uh, you might. I didn't want to make books. I wanted to be a gambler, yeah, I, I, bookmaker. My, my name ends in a vowel. Have you? Uh, good you, point. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Tom, we, good we, point. We, we, we know these things early on. So I just wanted to be a bookmaker. Okay, uh, no, no big deal. So, so what? How did you get where you are? I mean, just like, give me the ninety second. You know, from here I went to there, to there, to there, to there. Well, it takes a lot longer than ninety seconds because what a long, strange trip it's been. I, I just want to go back to the point where when people would take a shot at my radio show, you know, people, now that you have social media, everybody that likes to hate will take shots Ooh. at everything. And here's the bottom line about radio. You know, look at Bob Lonsbury, for instance. You couldn't be the more opposite from what I do. But people that like Bob Lonsbury, that's the best show in the world. People that love me, that's the best show in the world. There's, for every show on the radio, somebody loves it. Every show. Right. Your show. Somebody loves your show. So, you know, you, to say you suck or uh, it's the, the, people like to say show A is so much better than our, my show. Mm -hmm. There's no show that's better. We're all talking. And if you like what you like, you like it. It's not better than this, and that one's no better than that. It's all the same. And, you know, I go back with the Howard Stern fights. There's so much to talk about. Oh, yeah. It's just people talking. But what I want to say, get this out quick, is that what my show is is unique. Maybe not good, but unique. Because I will tell you and go up against anybody because my life experience is more unique than anybody you're listening to on the radio and uh, more different. And so you get those those points of view and they might not be what you like but they'll be different you know what i'm hearing here and it's it's sort of like to put it in, in, in a lighthearted way you know this is this is uh this is frank sinatra this is my way you know, this is what you think. You, you're doing it your way, yeah. regardless of what anybody thinks, right? I mean, isn't that really what you're saying? Well, that's uh, I don't get to do it that way anymore. <laughs> but back when I did, back when I did it my way, uh, completely, uh, it was joyous for me. So what was the most fun you've had doing this? I mean, oh my God. What, what, I mean you must have met some people along the way. Bro, and, you know, in yeah. the studio... In studio, Adam Sandler, Jerry Seinfeld, Chris Rock. Uh, of course, my best is Sam Kinison. I don't even know if you know. Oh who yeah, he I is. know who Sam Kinison is. Well, Sam was my boy, and he would back early in my career. This is maybe late eighties, I think late eighties. Sam Kinison and I bonded when he played the club, Little Dinky Club. Sam grew. From the club to Madison Square Garden, the War Memorial, and he stayed loyal. Before he was even on Howard Stern, he would be on my show, and then we had battles. But when Sam would come to western New York, when he got big, he would spend a week on my show in my studio. And so when the night that he played in Buffalo, he would do the interview on the Buffalo Rock Station from my studio with me. 
So that made me elevate my importance. And then when he played Syracuse, he did the interview on the Syracuse station from my studio with me. This is very early. So this was so great. I think he helped push my career. We had some of the greatest times, and there's videos. You know, there were naked women. There was all the debauchery you can think of, food, people. It was a bacchanal. We'll be right back with more of Brother Wee's on the No Nonsense Roundtable right after this. Welcome back to the No Nonsense Roundtable. I'm Dom Geneva, and we're joined by Brother Wheeze. <laughs> so when was the first uh, radio show you hosted? It was 1985? Nine, the, well, here's yeah. what happened. I was a concert promoter before I was on the radio. Mm-hmm. Uh, we brought Ozzy Osbourne, for instance, to Rochester for the first time he was ever here at the uh, War Memorial. We brought Def Leppard and Judas Priest to the Triangle Theater. So at that time, the rock station, we used to buy time on the rock station. And uh, Trip Reeb, uh, he's nobody anybody will know listening to your show, <coughs> but Trip was the program director out of Philadelphia. Tripp was the program director of our station. And which, of course, we became good friends because he would come to all the shows. We had really major rock shows. So one night, he said to me, Weez, this is at the show, at a concert. He said, Weez, you ever want to be on the radio? This is a true story. And I said, who doesn't want to be on the radio? He said, well, can you go in tonight? It was a weekend night. Can you go in from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. tonight? And I said, I don't know how to push the buttons. I have no idea how to do that. He said, I got a college girl up there. She will push the buttons. You just do the, you know, introduce the music. And back then, you picked your own records. I'm talking Ah, records, vinyl. I said, man, this sounds like a ball. And that's basically the start. And I will tell you, uh, just to keep being more verbose, but I also won a big award years ago at a morning show convention in Atlanta. So the guy that put me on the radio, his name was Trip Reeb. He was the program director, the first rock program director in this station in Rochester, New York. And he asked me if I wanted to be on the air at a concert in the middle of the night. This is after we're working all day at a rock and roll show. And I said, sure. And we came in and did it. But I'm trying to make a long story short. He was the godfather because without trip, I'm not brother wheeze. It never mm-hmm. happens. And I've been wheeze my whole life. But I didn't know what to be on the radio. So because I like to call people brother to this day, I've been saying to you, Brother Dom. Uh, so I said, let me be Brother Weez. To be honest with you, if I thought it was going to be a career, I don't think I'd be Brother <laughs> Weez. But anyway, I won a big award, a, a national award at a morning show a convention a bunch of years ago. And I had to have somebody there. Uh, and Tripp came from Chicago at the time. He's a real big guy in the radio business. And so he's there. He showed up and freaked me out. And uh, when I gave my speech, and it was a packed room, I had a cry, cried. I had tears. I'm very Aww. sensitive that way. Because trip without trip, there's no wheeze. Yeah. And he was the fact that he showed up there, I didn't even know that uh, he was coming or he knew about it or anything. And when I talked, I had him stand up in the back of the room and people knew who he was. And then I was crying because Uh, he invented me. Uh, God bless you. Everybody needs somebody like that in their life. You're not kidding. So I'm a newcomer to Rochester. I've only been here since 1993. (laughs) Okay. That's, uh, That's you know, 20 years. So, well, well, yeah, it's, it's, 30. Yeah, what am I 30, talking about? Well, yeah, uh, sooner, or later, I'll, sooner or later, people will accept. <laughs> but, so I, I'm, I, I fly into Rochester. I get off the airplane. I rent a car. I go down the road, and there's a bus. And on the side of the bus is a big sign, Wheeze. And I'm like... Is is that is that like an asthma thing? Yeah. <laughs> is it, it's like is is that call letters for the radio station? Is I mean what I mean what is what is wheeze? Which compels the question: How did you get to be known as 
wheeze? Well, that's a bad question because it's not a good answer. When I was probably that's a bad question. When I was probably ten, eleven, or twelve, that's a bad question. I lived over in the ABC streets off of Park Avenue in Harvard. My name, my real name is Alan Levin, and maybe eight houses from me lived Alan Levine. Same spelling of the first name, same exact last name except with an E. So to differentiate, they used to say, Alan, at number one school up on Hillside Avenue, we both step up. So one of us, so I used to be kind of good at stealing things and so I could weasel in and out of stuff. So they call me the wheeze, the weasel, which is when people hear that, they would now want to call me the weasel, which is sort of a deprecation. No, that, that's it's, where no, the, it's not. The brothers, just, that's yeah. where the name came from. And it went all the way through Vietnam, in the Army, in Philadelphia, a million things, a million miles. No, I, I, I like it. I, I think it's good. It's recognizable. I think the brother adds to it, makes you feel. It's like Cousin Brucey. You know, you got Cousin Brucey and you got Brother Wheeze. <laughs> Big difference. <laughs> but... Cousin Brucey, semi-honorable, the wheels. Uh, <laughs> but get out of that question. You, you, you seem to be comfortable in your own skin. Is that uh, That's not an overstatement, is it? No, I mean, the whole thing is, uh, I think everybody should be. And, ah. You know, I've got a strange history. Uh, I've done things that some people think are terrible because I was on the Lonsbury show by phone years ago talking about my Vietnam experience and my AWOL and my drill sergeant experience. And people uh, called in when I was done with a true story thinking it was terrible. I was a bad person. And that just goes to show you, uh, you know, living your own skin is right. I'm, I, I am not unproud. I am not ashamed of anything I've ever done. Because, I, you know, I think... People, some of the people that I don't like right now, politically, should be ashamed more than me. Mm. But we won't go there. My personal thing is, I don't mind people that disagree with me, and I don't mind hearing somebody's point of view. The thing I don't like is 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 somebody who is uh, hypocritical, or disingenuous, or, or whatever. And as long one. as you, as long as you're true to what you believe, that is, that's the whole thing with this no nonsense roundtable show. I, I I don't care what your opinion is. I want you to give me your opinion, and the ten thousand people that are listening to us. So you are on the political spectrum. You're more liberal than conservative, and we're talking to a bunch of conservative people. Like come out of the home repair clinic today. So, if you were to have a message for these listeners, what would it be? <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, it's funny. I try to stay off of politics on our morning radio show because uh, the, the division in this country right now, Dom. I, I know you're aware. This is the worst. This country has been divided, I think, since the Civil War. And some people on one side of the political spectrum, you can't deny it, have even threatened a civil war. And actually, some people in Congress, there's a woman in Congress saying that we should separate right now. So I try to avoid politics on my show because some people see me on the wrong side. So I don't want to blow off any listeners. But this morning, I had to bring it up for the first time, or not the first time, but I had to bring it up because I truly wanted an answer from conservatives to the question. I went on my phone, and Breitbart had a post uh, about Reese Witherspoon having a new TV show where people sing country music, and she would have, uh, she would have somebody that's non-binary on every episode. And so they posted it, and the, there were over 3,000 hateful responses from conservative people saying, oh, I will never look at Reese Witherspoon again, I can't stand it, good luck with that show, who wants to see that crap? I read some of these uh, responses on the radio this morning, and I said to conservatives, can somebody please tell me what you hate 
about somebody doing something kind to other people because I truly want an answer. I don't know what would spurn you on to hate something like that. And then one lady said to me, well, we don't care what people do with their own lives, but why do you have to shove it down our throat? Well, that's a a typical answer I hear from right-wing people all the time about gay TV or any kind of inclusive stuff. Nobody's shoving it down your throat. It's just something that you don't like, and you don't want to see the future, and I don't blame you. It bothers you. But no one's shoving it down your throat. Push a button. It's just, you know, being nice to some people that live. And that's the future, and it ain't going away. Well, you remember the day years ago where even even with rock and roll, I mean, you don't listen to rock and roll, do you? That's a fact. Right? What about race music? Do you know about that? No. Expand on that. I will. Back in the day, matter of fact, if you see the film, I forget if it's rent or hairspray. I think it's hairspray. But both of them have racism in it. I don't, have you ever seen either of those? No, I haven't. They're wonderful. But basically, at the beginning, when they had the dance TV shows and everything, there was play, they didn't want whites and blacks dancing with each other. And they used to call, certain people used to call black music, race music. That's a part of our history. And uh, they didn't want it. That if you go back and check out the history of music, you'll see what went on. It took a long time. Elvis had a break in, you know, doing some what they were. They they even mother they used to be mad at Elvis for doing race music. Fascinating stuff. We'll be right back. We're back with Brother Wee's on the No Nonsense Roundtable. Now, I said a lot of the questions that I asked, you know, a lot of them are not all that serious, but there is a serious question I have for you. I mean, uh, and I'm sure there's not many people that know about this, and it has to do with a a matter of character and good character, I I would say, uh, to give you, to give you, well, you're you're a character and a character, okay? You have character and you are a character. So the, the story goes that you took extra tours in Vietnam to save other people from having to take those tours. Is that, is that true? Well, it's not exactly true, but I like to say it. Uh, me and a very me and my guardian, when I went to Vietnam, the first guy I met was this Puerto Rican kid from Bedford Stuyvesant, Manhattan, in the first calf of Airborne Brigade, the first brigade of the first Air Cavalry in Vietnam in 1966. Uh, Andre Massa, and he became my brother in war and we did all three trips together and we did we did it because i use the excuse that i was keeping somebody from going i know most people didn't want to go but once we figured out the game here's the bad part here's the part where when you said character People that listen to the Bob Lonsbury show, this is part of the story that I told years ago that people think I'm a scumbag. What happened was me and Andre found out how to how to play the game in Vietnam because we were both 11 Bravo. That's a combat veteran. We were infantrymen, airborne infantrymen in the cab. And, but the second trip, we were what they called honor guards. It started in Saigon, and then they moved us up. Uh, no, wait a minute. Yeah, it was in Saigon, and then they moved us up to Long Bin. And my third trip uh, was a door gunner and an aviation outfit called 120th Aviation. And they were called the Deans. And they were like a uh, chicken. They were the easiest aviation company in Vietnam. They had four platoons of, of helicopters. Three of them were just, they took around generals, photographers, journalists, and there was one uh, gunship. Of, and they put me in gun. But long story short, me and Andre, you know, we were, we were, I don't want to say it on your show. We were having a good time <laughs> on those second two. Once you're in the jungle, once you are in combat, 
Yeah, I think if you ask anybody that was actually in combat in Vietnam, in the woods, in the jungle, anything after that, is cake. Yeah. So once we were in the rear, don't forget, we had to sleep in the jungle in the monsoon season, in the rain, in the swamps, in the rice paddies, leeches. I mean, the elements Oof. were as bad as getting shot at. So in the second two tours, I had a bed, an EM club. I had women in town that you could do things with. Uh, we had marijuana. Listen, bro, this is real. Well, uh, you're jumping out knows. of planes, right? I mean, Say again? <laughs> you're, you're, you're jumping out of planes. I mean, this is what you're doing. You're airborne. No, no, no. That's the I mean, first tour. I mean, the first tour, you're jumping out of planes. No, so, no helicopter no, once. Helicopter, okay. We were airborne. We were paratroopers. It's, it's still jumping out of something that is not on the ground. Once. <laughs> we, we used to get kicked. You know, it's wow. funny. You made me just, I always have to be reminded of things. But when they, when I was in the infantry the first trip, well, they used to take, when we used to go in the helicopter, they used to kick us out, literally. You know, maybe six feet, four feet. What, you know, they had to get you out. You had to, they kicked you out and then they, so they could get out of yeah. there. And I said after a couple of months, you know what? I'm going to be that guy one day. <laughs> I want, And I did. I became that guy on my third trip. So, but you slept in a bed. Yeah. You got yeah. high with your buddies at night. You, we, I got another fun. I got so many stories, it's ridiculous. Uh, the other guy you kicked, uh, kicked his ass is Howard Stern. Well, I didn't, you know, Howard... <laughs> Howard talk, made talk about big, yeah. Talk about why well, you dominated the market when he tried to come in here, right? I mean, well, he made a major mistake. Yeah, what was he that? made a major, major mistake when he did his press conference when he came to town because when Howard went from town to town, he would have a press conference and he used to tell people, "When I beat the guy, and there was always a guy, I was the one here. When I beat Brother Weeze, I'm going to have a funeral." And they used to do ah. that. He did it for John DeBella in Philadelphia. As a matter of fact, our old boss was the boss in Philly when that happened. And I used to, so when he came here, he did the same thing. But then what happened was, see, the one difference between Howard Stern and I, I will never say my show is anywhere near as good as Howard Joe, because Howard's in Manhattan, and I'm in Rochester, New York. He has every top guest in the world. I can't get every top guest in the world in Rochester, New York, in the studio, but my show was real, and Howard's show is fake. That's, I could say that. Howard's a character. He, that's not him in real life. Right. That's his character. So when he comes to each town, when he came to Rochester, he had to get stuff about me. So he had people feed him crap about Brother Weeze that he could say on the radio what a bad person I was. Yeah. And what he did was he said I abandoned my special needs daughter in Philadelphia. Ooh. So the day he came on the air... After my show, one of the TV channels was waiting for me in the production room for an interview. So I go in there, and they're interviewing me. I can't even tell you 8, 10, or 13, one of those. And they said, uh, they started interviewing me, and they said, well, what do you think about what he said about you? I go, well, I obviously have no idea what he said about me because I'm on the air at the same time. And they told me that he said that I abandoned my daughter, Diane, and ran from her. And, of course, first of all, it made me cry because I told you what a sissy I am. And second of all, uh, I said, I can't believe he said that. I really couldn't. I said, how could anybody Pull that in just to win ratings and just to beat somebody right. in radio. Right. Who's that ugly? Right. But he did. And the next day, on the front page of the Rochester paper, was a headline story about what he did. Let me tell you, that my the, 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 Diane's mommy, who, by the way, is still on this show to this day, my show, not this show. Uh, they were going to send people. To, they were outraged. But I think that really hurt his cause. Yeah. And yeah. so what happened was I beat him every rate. I'm the only guy in the country 
to where he went to beat him every single ratings book but one. And he beat me by a tenth of a point, and then it went back. And he had called me a few years ago to apologize for how he acted, and I think that he was going through a 12-step program, sincerely. Yeah. Well, it, it's a low blow. I mean, it, it, there's no reason for somebody to do that. And uh, a lot of these things I see online with people posting stuff, it says more about them than anything else. Oh, yeah. You know, that's that's what you're looking at when you're looking at something like that. But the other thing is, is that people have to understand that people here knew you. A lot of people loved you. They were hearing great radio. And for somebody to mass produce this like it's uh, uh, not a local uh, brand uh, is not necessarily what people are looking for. I know, like, my children, my two daughters, 30 and 33, would rather go to a local barista then go to Dunkin' Donuts because cool. it's it's the local guy and Not you're cool, the, and, and you're the guy. Dunkin's my boy, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I but, hear but, you. but you hear there's a certain amount of people that prefer that, so they would prefer to hear you even though you don't have you know this this nationally you. you know famous guy on today because they're hearing you. True, but, but you know the funny thing was. That you know, uh, I you know, the, getting those kind of guests just makes an automatic show. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean, yeah, it's, it's easier for them, sure. Way easy. More of Brother Wee's coming up right after this. Welcome back to the No Nonsense Roundtable. I'm Dom Genova, and we're joined by Brother Wee's. One of the things. I want to get into before it gets uh, too long into the show is that you're going to be inducted into the Rochester Music Hall of Fame on April 30th. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, sing there in in addition to, like I said, the National uh, Radio Hall of Fame, which is really outstanding. Uh, You were just elected this year or inducted you're going to be inducted this year and so let's let's talk a little bit about that i mean uh it's got to be uh, rewarding for you to be recognized by your peers i would imagine well it's a, it is going to be fun it's going to be a lot of fun and joan osborne is coming in for me which uh, really warms my heart and makes it even greater but of course i've taken a backlash for that dominic why be a while people wrote, well, bro, we, when do DJs, well, they don't realize I have such a long history with music. And by the way, we haven't mentioned, I was the head MC. I was the boss ah, MC yes. of the last two Woodstocks. I was the concert promoter here in Rochester. We continued to promote concert. I, I was a consultant to many other major shows here in town. Me and Billy, the t- I had a music show for years, way more than 10 years, where I used to, on the radio, where you used to have to only play commercial music, we had a music show where we tried to play music that you don't hear commercially, and which really helped certain careers. Right. Which Tedeschi Trucks, Joan, their Roger, I can name a bunch of bands, Kelly, Kelly, uh, Jesus, it's I, that's how bad I'm going. But you know, I have a ton of do right. with music. Right. No. 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 I, and analogous is look at Jeff Springett, right? Well, I mean, Springett. Jeff, I mean, Springett doesn't. He doesn't play a, mu- a musical instrument. No. no but, he's, he's, but, but, he's, but he's but he's in the Hall of Fame. She right. Deserves it. Absolutely. So I mean, and, and that's that is again a thrust of this show because people know you as as a disc jockey or radio personality, but you you produced and you've directed and, and, and had all these other things that you've done. One of the things I really did want to get into though is uh, tell me about uh, Woodstock '99 because that seemed like a real disaster. It was a disaster, but the fact that I was backstage and on stage the whole three days. I did not know, honestly, what how bad it was going. Now, the fact that I did 94 and 99, I get them mixed up because I'm an old nutcase. Uh-huh. But the one thing I remember in particular about 99 was that we were going to have a big party after this, when it ended. My f- good friend, the reason I have that gig, John Scherer, the promoter, uh, you know, the the backstage at something like Woodstock is huge. It's a city. So they had a bunch of uh, 
of mobile homes, and we were going to have a barbecue afterwards. And I had an office, let's say, right behind the curtain of the stage. I had my pregnant wife, Doreen, with me, uh, very pregnant. And we, we had chairs, and each band, before they came on, would come and sit with us, and then they would go on. Right, you know, they would have to come up there. And when the Red Hot Chili Peppers came up, Flea was naked. Uh, and if you ever see, you know, he played naked. And he sat down next to my wife with his schmeckle <laughs> hanging out and the whole friggin' everything. And people, and they went out there. When they went out there to play, I was excited. They're the last act, and we're going to have a good time. And they went out there. And that's when they started burning the joint down. Oh, yeah. Basically, was a riot, right? This sort of. Yeah. Definitely. It wasn't good. Say, it wasn't good. It was bad. It was bad. And they were burning the joint down. And the, to make it even worse, Red Hot Chili Peppers played the song Fire while they were doing it. it just encouraged them more. So instead of, you know, we had to be escorted out of there by state police. But uh, it was it was bad. Yeah. It was, it was, I mean, there was a lot of great music. There was a lot of good things, but I did not know how bad it was. Uh, I, you know, wait a minute. There's a documentary about it where they make my good friend, my man, John Sher look pretty bad. Uh, but in that documentary, as bad as it was, they follow a few kids throughout the thing. And they all said, as bad as it was. They go back tomorrow and do it over again. Yeah. So I just want to make sure people know that. So what's the next step for you? Are you uh, working on something? And you have a contract through when? <laughs> Two more years. Good for you. Yeah. Good for yeah. you. Well, and the thing is, is that the thing I, I respect with people like you is that you morphed and you changed and you went from one group to another group and you did what you had to do. And you go around the mountain, through the mountain, blow the mountain up or whatever. You get from one side to the other, not sitting there kind of whining that, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Life is, you know, has given me some uh, problems or passed me by or whatever you do. You got to do, you know, and whether you whether you like wheeze or not, you can't deny that there is a wheeze. And you have your following and uh, people that love you, no matter what. You can't get everybody to love you. That's not going to happen. But Boy, people some love you. idiots like me would like it, though. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, sometimes on social networking and stuff, people say, yo, Weeze, I stick up for you all the time. Yeah. And I always go, what are the people? Why do you have to stick? What they say? Yeah. I always want, I just wish the detractors would call in and tell me their thing. Because if it's true, I'll admit to it. Yeah. But it, but there's so many yeah. lies. Yeah. But no. that's probably about everybody. No, I uh, I had somebody on the show the other day, and I taught my 7% rule. I'm giving you my 7% rule. I know I'm repeating this to my to my listeners, but my 7% rule is this. I used to make, I used to be uh, very concerned with making everybody happy. I'm going to clean up the language for, the, for my show. Maybe on your show, I change the language. But 7% of the people in the world I've discovered are either either nuts or mean. <laughs> and you can't do anything with them. And it's not like recyclables. You don't have to, you know, somebody thinks that, you know, like, uh, they're sovereign citizens or they they had a bad childhood. They just want to get even with you. You can't do that. You can't do anything with that 7%. And the thing is, online now, that percent, that 7% can get to you and you can't let it bother you. Yeah, I just wish it wouldn't, but I, yes, I, I, uh, I got a disease. <laughs> I got a disease. A wheeze disease. Well, it's mine. <laughs> it's the wheeze disease, but I just hate, you know, yeah. people talking crap about you. It's not true. If it's true, I'll stand by it. I got you, bro. Anyway, so uh, let's sell some tickets for the Hall of Fame. The uh, induction ceremony oh. is on uh, April, April 30th. 30th, and I think there are a lot of listeners that we have that remember you and remember you from the day, and uh, would come out uh, just to see you. So go on to the uh, website, the Rochester Music Hall of Fame website, and get some tickets and come see Weez. And see Joan Osborne and oh, many Joe other Osborne. things. Yeah. You know, it killed me when people were mad that Brother Weez was getting in because they just think it's some radio schmuck. Garth Fagan's getting in, too. Right. He deserves it. Right. A dancer. Well, another one of my favorite uh, people is uh, Fred Costello. 
you know, Fred, Freddie. Fred, Freddie is That's much, a musician. Right, much more than the Red Wing organist. I mean, you look at the, the, the uh, uh, times that he played in Vegas and Tahoe and the people he rubbed elbows with and whatever. He, he's much more, and a music teacher, much, much more than a ballpark organist. Well, you know, the, he used to be the punchline of a joke. You know, who played uh, for hockey and uh, baseball, professional hockey and baseball. Fred Costello played for both teams. And a great guy. Oregon. Well, Brother Weez, I have to say, it has been a hoot. And I appreciate you coming in. And I'd like to remind everybody that uh, the No Nonsense Roundtable is on every Saturday morning, 10 o'clock on News Radio M 1180. And you can get all our past episodes on NoNonsenseRoundtable.com. So, till next week, we're going to have to say, see you then. Thanks for listening. Tune in 10 a.m. Saturdays on News Radio Wham 1180 or stream at wham1180.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll make more.